One of the interesting things about people arguing and debating this whole silly notion of religion versus relationship hmm. is somehow the idea that you can have one without the other. You can't. Your relationship with God is based upon the religion of God. God being the center of that religion. Now, it's a nice cliche to try to explain away 2,000 years of church history and say, oh, well, we don't want to be a part of the church because of all the bad that's happened and all the good. We just want to say, today we're brand new. We're suddenly arrived on the scene and we're the new kids on the block. No, we're not. God's always had faithful men and women of God throughout the ages. From the moment Jesus rose from the dead onward, it's a continuation process, not a brand new revelation that you suddenly became aware of and now you're born again and suddenly you're like the head kid. Or that because some denomination or some observation of some religious observances and practices have gone off on tangents that maybe aren't beneficial anymore that you think oh well we're not like them we're like us so rather than be them we're us and we're you know we got it and they don't that's kind of dangerous to do you know Because usually if you take a look at the history of most of these places of what you think of as them, they were like us. And they became them by starting out as us and then us gradually becoming them. And that's kind of scary because you need to realize that it's very easy for you to get off tangent and become the tangent rather than become the example of what God wants you to be as opposed to what you want to tell others how to be. And that's really dangerous. We always have to be careful of that in ourselves because if we don't pay attention to understanding the whole aspect of what religion is, we'll go off on a tangent because it is kind of interesting is that religion has its own reward. There's a great benefit to religion. Perfect religion, as this James said, you know, in that taking care of the widows and orphans, there's an action to our relationship or a manifestation of our relationship that presents itself as religion. See how that works? You have relationship, the manifest the way that you prove that you have relationship with God is by your actions, and your actions are what we call religion. Those are those things that are the outward appearance of what's gone on in the inside with your observation of a relationship with God by dealing with Him personally, intellectually and emotionally and physically. So that as you take in from your relationship with God, you're giving out to your relationship to your fellow man. The relationship with God is your relationship. The relationship with man is your religion. It's kind of like, you know, the R&Rs. If you really want to rest and relax in it, you know, you might want to keep your relationship and your religion both intact. But people don't like to hear that. You see, they want a cliché. They want to be able to say, not us, not me, oh, them, her, it, that, which, where, what, how, why. And that's sad. Because you see, I enjoy religion. I really thrill over the whole idea of religion because to me, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding are all the three key elements of religion or my religious observance of my religious obs my religious well my religion <laughs> wisdom pursuant thereof enjoying it knowledge of it growing in it discovering that wisdom is the knowledge of the Holy One wisdom is the knowledge of God wisdom is discovering that it's a part of the Holy Spirit that is something that God gives by the application of the knowledge that he's given us with by applying the experiences through life 
we become wise and we learn that that is wisdom as it's applied according to the grace and mercy that God's given us so that we are exemplified by that with which the manifestation of the Holy Spirit is in and of itself wisdom himself so we can pursue after wisdom if we're pursuing after God. And in that respect, I love it. Because, you know, my intellectual mind, my intellect, my spirit, my soul, my hermeneutic, my homiletic, my traditions, my genetic makeup, the fact that God gave me a brain so I could think, that God, that God gave me a soul so I could feel, that God gave me a spirit so I could be aware of the things of the spirit, that all comes into conjunction with the idea of wisdom. And it comes together in the person of Jesus. And I get excited about that in religion. Because that is what my religion is. My idea of prayer, my ideas of God, my ideas of anything that there is in life all come from religion. And so I enjoy that in my relationship with God. Some people don't. Oh well. I don't often know what to tell them. You got both, whether you know it or not. Now, if you only got one and not the other, you could have a problem. Because if you think you only got one, you're blind to the other. And if you think you got one and you don't have the other, then you're blind to the other. See how that works? If you don't got both, you're blind to one or the other. <laughs> Interesting. The Christian, a citizen of heaven living on earth, and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Daniel 12, 3. Let a man become enamored of eternal wisdom and set his heart to win her, and he takes on himself a full-time, all-engaging pursuit. Thereafter, his whole life will be filled with seekings and findings, self-repudiations, tough disciplines, and daily dyings as he's being crucified to the world and the world unto him. Amen. <laughs> I, because of uh, Leon Patilosov, but also other reasons, but I decided to pursue wisdom. I chose what I call the way of Solomon. You know, I wanted to be ready to give to every man an answer for the hope that lies within me, but I wanted it to be to the exclusion or to the inclusion of that, but also beyond that, to the point of saying, "Hey, I got the answer. I, Jesus, you know." said we could know the answer. I, I know the answer. We got it. You know, I want to be able to give to every man an answer. Not just like a Bible answer man, you know, which says the scripture and then leaves it alone, but you know, an answer for all of it. You know, The summation of the total perspective of the realization of the Word of God in our life as we're living it out in this dimension of reality that we call life itself. And so I wanted that. I wanted to know more and go for more. So I would study Proverbs, and I did. Man, I was into Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, applying it to my life, making it applicable. You know, it's like the King's Dainties. You know, don't eat at the table. You don't eat too much. You know, because lest you, uh, you know, in lest you offend the king. And that king means that if you go over to your neighbor's house, for instance, like a friend's house, you know, and you're a man of appetite, it's better to cut off your hand or your tongue, you know, than to be a man of gluttony or a man of appetite. And so, I would go over to my friend's house, you know, and I would eat small portions. And whatever it was, no matter where I went, if it was an invitation, I would remember the proverb and I'd eat a small portion. And God blessed me for it. And I learned a lot from it. There was a demonstration of the applicable wisdom that came from that kind of knowledge. And I learned a great deal about life in general and people's biases and prejudices and weirdo ideas and kind of brain formatting. <laughs> Because it worked. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, the Bible works, but why is <laughs> really kind of interesting. You know, why Proverbs says that? Fascinating. Because men are ego, you know. But all of Proverbs, I began to see it as an applicable way of life. It can be made a real in your life to live that way according to the Word of God and make that uh, not just like some kind of legalism where you do like, you know, Shabbat or some weird thing about the mitzvot or the, you know, commandments or the 613 ways of doing things that you think that you got to do that you can't figure out because you don't know that there aren't more than 613, that there actually are more than 613, that there aren't really 613, that you have to kind of compromise in order to get that many and get that few. Really, you do. Because <laughs> guess what? There's a lot more. 
you just, you know, got to really kind of sit down and kind of go step by step, line it out and go, now wait a minute, where did they come up with 613? I just came up with 616 and now 620. And now, you know, if I combine these, they'd probably get it back down to 600. Hey, sorry, one man invented it, so it's kind of like, you know, the interpretation of it. If God doesn't say it, like 613, it ain't there. Don't trust Jewish interpretation. Which is what rabbinicalism is, because it's based upon a man's assertion of a bunch of rabbis sitting around going, Hey, you know, I think we got a bunch here. What do you think? You think we got a bunch? Yeah, I think we got a bunch. No, I don't think your school's right. I think my school's right. Your school's not right? Well, if your school's not right, hey, I'm Purdue, you know, you're Georgia Tech. Uh-uh. Uh, we don't do it that way. We're the Bulldogs or whatever they may be. I don't know what teams are mascots, so I probably just messed up somebody's mascot. <gasps> God forbid. Oh, no. Excommunicate. But having said that, wisdom in and of itself, I love because it's so logical. It makes sense. It seems to work. It's something that fits. It's something that I enjoy. Maybe I'm a little weird about that way. But I do see doing and not doing it according to the wisdom of God and not of man. The regenerated man, or the born-again Christian, had been inwardly separated from society as Israel was separated from Egypt at the crossing of the Red Sea. The Christian is a man of heaven temporarily living on earth. The Christian is a man Though in spirit divided from the race of fallen men, he must yet in the flesh live among them, dealing gaily with them. In many things he is like them, but in others he differs so radically from them that they can't not but see and resent it, be angry about it. Why won't you come down to the strip joint? That's where we do business. No, I don't think so. Well, I have rights. I have the right to bear arms. So I'm going to exercise my right to bear arms. I don't think so. I may have the right, but I have the privilege to serve Jesus. So I choose to give up my rights for the privilege of the gospel. Because I would rather present the gospel in every situation than to exercise my right to bear arms in an isolated <laughs> situation. It might require me to do something that I might regret later that I don't know the consequences thereof because I haven't lived past this life. And if I shoot someone, I'm not so sure that I know what happens to them afterwards or that God might say to me, with my hands being bloodied, taking the life of another soul. Maybe you feel comfortable with that. From the days of Cain and Abel, the man of earth has punished the man of heaven for being different. The long history of persecution and martyrdom confirms this. But we must not get the impression that the Christian life is one of continuous conflict, one unbroken, irritating struggle against the world, the flesh, and the devil. No, not at all. The heart that learns to die with Jesus soon knows the blessed experience of rising with him. And all the world's persecutions cannot still the high note of holy joy that springs up in the soul that has become the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit himself. When you tell me that I'm a temple of the Holy Spirit, when you tell me that I have the third person of God, the Trinity, in me, when you tell me that God is with me, when you tell me that God is for me, when you tell me that God is my forward, my strong tower, and my shield, when you tell me that God is all these things, I don't get the idea of having to have a gun to protect myself. Call me stupid or call me wise. But my reality is that I know the difference between taking something and making something your idol and idolizing it to the extreme point of it not being necessary, but it's being something you want to do. 
And that's the flesh. Because you see, there are people that in their job, yeah, of course, you know, if you have to have a gun, you have to have a gun. So what? No big deal. Lots of police officers, lots of patrolmen, lots of security guards. I've been a security guard. You know, I was in the military too. Lots of people go through the military experience, don't have to kill anyone. They don't have to shoot anyone. Lots. A lot more than you think. There are people that have. They'll have to deal with it. They that live by the sword shall die by the sword. The blood of another man will be required at your hands. It doesn't matter whether you're innocent or guilty. It just means that the blood is required. What you present as your defense, I don't know. Grace abounds, and where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. And so, frankly, you kill, be forgiven. But you better deal with it, because God will require of you that man's blood. It's just the way it is. What did you do to that man? If you have an answer, praise the Lord. <laughs> Maybe, you know, I was saluting the flag and I got sent, so it was okay. Because I was doing it in the name of God and country. Not that I've never heard that one before. And, you know, there are people that say, well, in the Old Testament they did that. Yeah, yeah you know, till Jesus came along. Kind of screwed that one up. <laughs> Oops! And since that time, well, yeah, some Christians have gone out, you know, and said that it's okay to kill, you know, in the name of God, you know, crusades and pogroms and holocaust, you know, and, you know, white supremacists, you know, and terrorists, you know. But then again, there were some Christian martyrs who said they loved not their lives even unto death, you know, and they were witnesses of these things that they had handled, of these things that they had seen, even the Word of God. You see, a lot of modern Christians have gotten a little compromised by stepping into what they want to do to make themselves wise rather than read the Word and not listen to Satan's lies. Because in the last generation, the one thing that's going to be made manifest, that's obvious to all of us, is violence. Violence would increase. As it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. They married and they were given in marriage, and what else happened in the days of Noah? Let's go see. Every thought of man was towards violence, and it repented of the Lord that he had made man. Every thought of man was violence. He was watching violence. In those days, it might not have been on TV might have been in real life. Hmm, kind of like what we do with our gangs, you know, and our posses, you know, kind of like things happening down the street, you know. And they were considering violence, you know, let's protest, let's argue, let's debate, let's be angry, let's be mad, let's be furious, let's get even, let's go defend our country, let's go kill somebody in the name of life, liberty, in the pursuit of happiness. Hmm. Violence would increase in the latter days. And the reason being is that the last objection of man in rebellion to God is violence. Because, you see, the person we serve isn't the prince of power. It isn't the mighty God come to rule and reign. Although he will be the mighty God. And in his father's name, he will rule and reign. But you see, the mighty God is the Father. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. There's a problem here that if you kind of mix the two metaphors, you know, then you're mixing metaphors and you're not dealing with the factual reality of Jesus. Because he doesn't have to exercise any violence at all. Matter of fact, there's a common expression I use in teaching the book of Revelation and in coming to the Valley of Megiddo when there is... You know, all the horses ride in and, you know, Jesus comes, you know, and there's the whole, you know, hordes of hell, so to speak, and armies of the earth all gathered together in the valley, you know, and down in the valley, valley so low. And I have a personal opinion that because he holds all things together by the word of his own mouth, so to speak, that... Uh, all he says to the uh, people in Megiddo is, Peace, be still. Just like you do with the storm, and poof, everything stops. Well, I think in Megiddo, everything comes undone. 
literally the cells fly apart and the blood just gushes everywhere because they're so full of violence and hate and wrath and malice that all Jesus has to say is peace or shalom or shalom aleichem wouldn't that be a shock to so many people now because they've heard of uh, Islam you know they know what Asalam Aleichem is you know which is kind of a Arabic way of saying Shalom Aleichem Shalom Aleichem but anyways the point being is peace be unto you is what Shalom Aleichem or peace be unto all of you and peace Shalom would be an interesting word if he said that at that time and if everything happened according to what I believe he says because I don't see Jesus carrying a sword I see the word going forth out of his mouth like a sword peace suddenly that word just goes Phew, out there and <whistles> annihilates everyone oh that would be peace like a sword or the word going out of his mouth like a sword with eyes of fire because he's like you know coming in pure love have you ever seen anything that's pure man it's bright purity what if Jesus light is so bright that it's just the love of God manifested in such a pure way that it's a consuming fire that's my opinion that's my statement that's my wisdom and so I find that the wisdom of man has nothing to give to us but to come to the realization that it's failing and falling apart in the reality of the wisdom of God which was made manifest by the submission of Jesus to the cross willing to die that the Father might be glorified are you willing to die that your God may be glorified are you willing to give up your life and your wife and your children and your home security and your guns and your vacations and your Harleys and all these other things that are of the world that you might be less of the world and maybe just passing through the world and maybe giving more of your time not to riding, taking care of, repairing and fixing all these things that you own and possess that have possessed you now but rather you've turned it around and you've turned it back unto God and you've given it back over to Him and you said I don't want anything to come between me and you because I see that we have so little time left so few days remain so few years let me live it out right for the right to be your witness and testimony to the end of this age that I might go out as a light unto the Gentiles as a beacon to the Jew to remind all that Jesus is coming that Jesus is here that Jesus is in you are you different than the world or are you just a Christian version of the world 